Welcome to Mastering the Next, a cutting-edge podcast that explores the future of graduate, online, and non-traditional education through the lens of AI and technology. I'm your host, Dr. Ray Lutsky, Vice President of Strategic Partnerships at Element 451. Join me for discussions with some of the thought leaders shaping the future of graduate enrollment management through technology. Mastering the Next is a part of the Enrollify Network a robust collection of podcasts designed to help higher education professionals like you grow. Explore our other shows at enrollify.org or check out some of my personal favorites linked in the show notes below. Enrollify is made possible by Element 451, the next generation AI student engagement platform that helps institutions create meaningful and personalized interactions with students. Learn more at element451.com. Today on Mastering the Next, we have Dr. Alyssa Orlando, Director of Graduate Admission at Clark University in Massachusetts, discussing the significant impacts of decision-making biases in holistic graduate admission review processes. We'll explore how Clark University identifies and mitigates these biases to ensure fairness and equity and what the future holds for holistic admission practices in promoting diversity and inclusivity. Welcome, Alyssa. It's great to have you here. Thanks so much, Ray. It's a pleasure. So what's next for Clark University in addressing decision-making biases within your holistic graduate admission review processes? Yeah, so I guess... What's next is really kind of the iteration of how we've progressed our process over the last two and a half years since I've gotten to Clark. We came from a process that was very low rubric and low documented. And one of the things that I think people get wrong about holistic review processes very often is that the term holistic infers that you don't need a rubric or you don't need certain standards to go off of because the the term holistic essentially ensures that we're looking at all parts of the application, you know, the the classic Bastido term, whole person, whole context, whole file. But really what you're looking at is how do you make sure that those whole person reviews are standardized across the board so that every applicant is ensured a fair and equitable review process. So we moved all of our reading about a year and a half ago to uh, seasonal reading teams. So We have anywhere from four to eight readers across the board who review applications for us, and we do multiple rounds of reviewing. And then those applications go to faculty review committees afterwards. So the first step of that process happened this morning. We had our annual kickoff with our seasonal reading team. We went over our, I wouldn't say new rubric, but improved rubric from last year, our improved scoring methodology from last year, and really spoke at length with them about what it means to review an application holistically, really going through each piece of the process, each piece uh, or each component of the application and narrowing down for them, what does a holistic review look like in a standardized format, which almost seems contradictory at times, but I think for us, the newness is really just having that standardized process across the board. That's interesting. And I'm wondering, based on that, you can accommodate Mm -hmm. A a lot in terms of a process, but how does Clark University identify and mitigate unconscious biases during the admission review process to ensure that fairness and equity? Yeah, we try to remove a lot of the demographic data from applications first off as it comes out. I mean, obviously the Supreme Court response from last year kind of assisted with that in in a sense of removing as much of that from the review process and really just having the documents in front of readers. Obviously, when you're submitting documents about a certain individual, it's hard to remove all pieces of identifying information, right? Because students go to school and so they go to school in a certain place. And so there's possibility that, you know, citizenship might be inferred or current uh, address might be inferred or even something as as high stakes as as race or ethnicity could potentially be inferred from a student's application or from one of the various components that they submit to us. But in terms of mitigating those unconscious biases, I think that implementing a standard process across the board has assisted with that because we're asking for the same 
inference about an applicant every single time. And so when you're reviewing, you know, hundreds, in our case, we're reviewing upwards of 15,000 files a year, you start to see the same applications come through, right? You start to see applications for a computer science program. Here are the, the high applicants that are scoring really well. Here are the applicants that are scoring really low. And although we're never going to get rid of unconscious bias, I think we've done a good job of implementing ways to look for certain pieces of the application that allow our readers and our entire admission team to understand, okay, when I go in to review this file, I'm looking for X, Y, and Z factors. I think the other process or the other piece of this that is really challenging to, the other piece of this that is really challenging to grapple with is the reality that admission as its core is a selection process. And when you are working on and building a selection process, selection is biased, right? People get admitted or they don't. And so there are some pieces of bias, and that's what I researched a lot within my dissertation research, is there's just some pieces of bias that aren't going to be able to be pulled out. And that's a challenging thing to think about when you're thinking about how to make this process as equitable as possible for applicants that come into your funnel. You know, I think we've done a good job on our side of trying to ensure that fairness and equity across the board while mitigating bias to as small of a component as we can, knowing that at the end of the day, certain students are going to be denied from the program because otherwise we wouldn't have an admission process. We would just have a form. Right. And we are humans with our own human foibles and can't avoid that we we develop biases throughout our lives. And that human touch is so critical in, in any kind of admission. It's never going to be completely driven by artificial intelligence. There has to be that human piece. But Double clicking on what you just said, could you share some specific strategies or tools Clark University employs to train admission staff to recognize and overcome their own biases? Yeah, we have done a lot of training with uh, starting with research in the field. So really reviewing what scholars have indicated that might be ways to notice bias within yourself or ways to get at the bias that you might be thinking. We have a lot of international applicants, so a lot of the training that we've done with our team is how to recognize bias against international applicants, especially as it relates to the access and opportunities that students from different countries may have as they're competing for spots in a specific program. So what is a good experience? What is a bad experience? And how do those experiences mean or not mean anything as you're reviewing those processes. So we've used some some charts and honestly we a lot of the things that we do involve referencing previous cycle data and so uh, assessment is a big key component of how we train our staff. We go back to the data. First we look at individual rankings across the board with each staff member to say Ooh, you know, you hit a lot of twos last year. Um, you know, our average set, our average ranking system is on a one to five scale. Your rankings were pretty harsh last year. Why was that? And then, you know, comparatively to another staff member who maybe was a little nicer on their reviews. And so first we look at their individual data. Then we look at the data of the admitted class. We look at the data of the denied class. And then we look at the data of the enrolled class. And we try to make sense of, you know, were there any places where we got it wrong or where did we get it right and why was that? And so I think using assessment really has helped us mitigate bias because we're also looking at the data and saying, okay, why did we deny, and I'm not necessarily using this as an example for my own work, but, you know, why were 90% of the students from, X region or X background denied, and 90% of the students from this background were admitted. Now, it might be that that's just how the files came in, but the great thing about data is that it normally does not lie to you. And so when you're looking at you know those, those figures, it is hard to ignore. And so then you dive deeper and you see, okay, why, why did those things happen? 
Um, and then you start to make decisions from there. That data probably illuminates a lot of actionable insights, but how would you then you reconcile or balance the subjective elements in holistic admission, like a personal mm -hmm. statement or an interview, uh, when, you, when you look at those objective measures to, to continue to minimize that bias? Personal statements, you know, while they are a non-cognitive variable, they don't have a specific data metric attached to them. They also tell a lot more than just the student's story, right? So they're being evaluated typically for more than just the content. They're being evaluated for the writing skill set. They're being evaluated for adherence to the question. They're being evaluated for, you know, all sorts of things. And so I think it's it doesn't make sense to just say that it's totally a subjective decision as to whether what the ranking is on the personal statement. We kind of break that down into a few different categories. And so we do try to make that a little bit more of an objective measure. We also, one of the things I think about a holistic admission process is when you're trying to balance those subjective elements is that no one element outweighs the other. So the GPA on a student's undergraduate degree doesn't outweigh a strong personal statement. And it doesn't outweigh maybe someone didn't do as well on a standardized test that they submitted to us. So each of those rankings, while they have a number associated with them, they don't, they don't have any sort of weight to them. And that helps us in our subjectivity because we try to be as objective to each of those criteria as possible. I tend to rationalize or anecdote this with my team to say, if there's one piece of the application that's not strong, that's not a hindrance to their application most likely. Typically, if the remaining pieces of their application are really strong, then most likely, unless their program has other metrics that they're looking for from the faculty, that they're most likely going to be admitted. But if you start to see multiple areas where the student may not be successful in your program, that's when we start to dive deeper into the overall weight of those and and how many of those areas can be low before it starts to say, you know, I don't think this is a good decision for either of us, right? Because when you enter into an admission relationship with a student, you are putting trust in them to say, I believe that you're going to be successful and that the money that you spend here on an education that's already pretty expensive is going to be worth it and that you're going to persist and graduate from our program. And that's a lot of burden to bear on staff that might not have much background at all. So we try to make that as objective as possible for them. Hey there, it's Mallory, Chief Strategist of Enrollify. Higher Ed is facing a leadership crisis. The demands on today's college and university leaders are skyrocketing, and talent is leaving the industry at an unprecedented rate. New leaders like you are emerging, but no one is getting the proper training to be successful. Well, Enrollify is here to change that. Our new course, Lessons in Leadership, taught by Dr. Carrie Phillips, will prepare you to be a confident, empathetic, and effective leader. From systems thinking to adaptive leadership, building culture to handling difficult decisions, this comprehensive online course is perfect for new and aspiring leaders. Don't wait. The course starts September 9th, and for a lucky group of 26 students, we have the option to add interactive sessions with Dr. Phillips for personalized guidance. Visit enrollify.org to learn more. I'd like to double click on that, Alyssa, because, you know, faculty are a part of this process, and I assume they come with their own expectations. Does their outcome information or do do the the ways they perform academically then feed back into that process? Is that also part of this? Or is it very much sort of, I this is static, this is what I believe is re required for the program, and these students just didn't have that, therefore they were not successful? Is there a, a give and take there, you think? I would say there is. And the reason there is, I think, goes back to that assessment piece. So one of the things that we do with our academic teams is we try to get the top performers and the low performers the data back from the academic teams each semester to determine for the low performers in their programs, was it predictable? Did we go and give them a chance? Or was their application extremely strong and you would not have noticed or wondered that this student wouldn't be successful in the future. Same thing for our high performers, right? 
did we give those students a chance and they, you know, they took it and ran with it? Or were they a high performer in their undergraduate degree and they worked for 25 years and now they're coming back to school and we kind of predicted that they would be successful. So we definitely try to have a reciprocal feedback process with our faculty. One of the challenges I think is when a student is as academically prepared prepared for a program as they should be, it does become challenging to work with faculty to help them see other metrics. But, you know, in my dissertation research, that was one of the top findings that I had was that regardless of whether admission staff like it or not, faculty play a huge role in the admission process, even in programs where they don't actually read applications. So I think it behooves the teams on this side to extend that olive branch and try to work with that data because faculty respond very well to data. I mean, most of them are trained researchers, right? So the more information that you can provide to them to say, hey, you gave us your 25 top performers and 19 of them were the students that we told you to take a chance on, that gives them confidence in your structure, your matrices and your process to be able to say, you know, we trust you to move forward with these candidates as you see fit. So I think, you know, that give and take, but there are definitely, just like on the admission side, I mean, there's certainly staff members who don't feel like certain candidates will be successful in programs. That's why we don't just have one reader on applications, because if it's just one voice, then that's not necessarily a good thing. So we try always to have at least two reads, if not more than that, because it does make for a more well-informed review process. Just quickly, if a listener wants to go and find your academic work, your dissertation, what's the title? Oh, the title. You know, it's funny because I can't spit out the title very well because it's so long. They make you write these long dissertation titles. But it is Potential Bias Within Holistic Master's Admission Processes, and it's exploring the decision-making functions between when a student or when a staff member is in the process versus when they're not. It's on my Google Scholar profile. So if you go to scholar.google.com and you search Alyssa Orlando, you'll find it. I honestly cannot say the whole title. It is like 35 words. (laughs) Isn't that the most embarrassing thing? No, I mean, it's common, right? I mean, you see that with a lot of academic work, um, but I just know that for uh, many folks who are interested in learning more about this, you've referenced your dissertation. Going back a bit, Part of eliminating that bias, whether it's conscious or unconscious, is the inclusion of diverse perspectives uh, and voices mm-hmm. in the admission decision-making process. Uh, how, how do you leverage yeah. those to enhance the inclusivity and fairness of your evaluation? I think including diverse perspectives is a double, perhaps even triple-edged sword. The first piece of it is you only have the staff that you have, right? And so when you're building an admission process and you are including faculty, you are including staff, you only have the resources that are available to you. So sometimes the perspective is just quite simply not diverse. And that can be a challenge. So then thinking about as you have staffing changes, turnover, how do you begin to build a team that is diverse in perspective, that is diverse in background, that is diverse in demographics? Because it does it does build a unique Uh, environment to build an admission decision-making team. However, I think there's a lot to be said about the term diversity and what we use it for these days. And so I encourage teams to start building sort of like an experience matrix of where have you been in your life? What have you done? And what is that perspective that you have? Because I think even if a team looks homogenous across the board, it is very likely that that team is actually quite diverse. And so trying to figure out what are the unique perspectives from these people's point of view, and then building your decision-making process off of that. I also think just, in, I'll, I'm the a stickler for process, and I think I'll probably swear by this till I die, but process helps eliminate bias and it helps enhance fairness and inclusion. And so the more process that you have in place, the more likely it is that you're going to get to what, I mean, there's never going to be a right decision in admission, but as close to a right decision as you can, as many times over. And so the more training you provide to your team, the more building blocks you have for them, 
it allows them to make the same decisions regardless of their background and their voices. However, I think one of the things we've done over the last few years is I'm thinking we've probably had, let's say, 15 or so team members on my team over the last three or four years out of, you know, eight or nine staff lines, give or take. And out of those 15, two of those individuals have been immigrants. So they've they've come, both of them came to the U.S. as international students. And I mentioned earlier that most of our applicants are international students to Clark. And so that having those perspectives, but then also teaching those perspectives. So providing opportunities for your team to dialogue, for your team to learn to, from each other, because it's not enough to just have an experience you know, matrix. If you just have a spreadsheet, that's awesome. But then if no one knows and no one learns, then it's really hard. So we've had, we've been able to share those experiences, but then also, you know, we've had team members who have lived abroad. We've had team members who speak other languages. And so figuring out how we can share that knowledge and, and build each other's weaknesses or, or skill gaps to make our opinions more diverse. And so that when I go now into an application, from sub-Saharan Africa, I can look to my team member who's taught me about that region and I have more knowledge to be a, have a more informed decision. So even though I don't have that background, I'm not from sub-Saharan Africa, I am able to draw on that experience from someone that I've learned from. So I think, you know, having that experience and now I can teach that to other people, even though, again, I'm not from the region. I think that that's really important. In my previous job, I learned a lot about specifically students from India. And when I came to Clark, I taught our team a lot about that. And we actually do have a staff member in India who works for Clark. And maybe a month or so ago, you know, obviously we've become more close. And he mentioned to me that, you know, he couldn't believe that I've never lived in India because I was so well informed about the education system and the education practice. And like the intricacy is not necessarily like being from India, but, you know, learning about all of those things. And I said to him, I said, That is one of the reasons that we teach our team what the culture, what the foundations and what the systems are, because that helps them bridge those gaps and be more informed. So um, I think overall, it's never going to be perfect because we only have the people that we have. But if we can teach that, that builds bridges for those people to teach other people. And in, in tandem, your teams do become more diverse within the limits that you have. That's so valuable. I mean, especially considering that India is one of the top sending countries for graduate programs in the United States, being able to bring that to bear in your process, certainly including that voice. So if I could ask you, Alyssa, to use your crystal ball, maybe tell Mm -hmm. us what you think the future for holistic graduate admission, maybe specifically at Clark University, it will be, particularly in terms Mm -hmm. of what you might do to further reduce decision-making biases or promote diversity, however you want to define it? I think for us, the next step is including more voices on every file. And that's a challenge for us right now. We have, like I mentioned, about 15,000 master's applications a year. And our actual full-time team is a small team of seven, which includes our operations team, and our yield team. So it is challenging to to get a, a a double read and that has been really, you know, dramatically increased by bringing on our temporary readers. And so I think in our future is moving towards a, a two read model with additional staff members across the board for all of those applications as much as we possibly can. Um, but then I do see a potential for committee reviews in our future. I think That's not a process that a lot of mid-level institutions have implemented, especially on high volume programs. It's just almost impossible sometimes, especially when you have a rolling admission process. But if there is a methodology that we can employ, not if, when there is a methodology that we can employ to have almost a summarized review of all of those applications. I know you talk a lot about AI on your podcast. I'm hopeful there'll be some tools in the future that allow us to kind of bridge those gaps and present that data to faculty in a way that's not cumbersome because they're not going to read 200 applications every week. So how do we bridge that gap between the professionals in the field and the admission teams? I think that'll be the the next step. 
what that looks like, I don't know. The crystal is fuzzy. Well, those tools are on the way from Element 451 and a lot of other places. Yeah, exactly. And see <laughs> development, yeah, uh, for sure. Uh, Dr. Alyssa Orlando, Director of Graduate Admission at Clark University, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. Yeah, of course. Thank you for having me. The Mastering the Next podcast is a part of the Enrollify podcast network. If you like this podcast, chances are you'll like other Enrollify shows too. Our podcast network is growing by the month, and we've got a plethora of marketing, enrollment, and higher ed technology shows that are jam-packed with stories, ideas, and frameworks all designed to empower you to be a better higher ed professional. Our shows help higher ed marketers and admissions professionals find their next big idea and feature a selection of the industry's best as your hosts. Learn from Artis Cadieu, J.C. Bonilla, Mallory Wilsey, Brendan Henkel, Brian Gross, and so many other of your favorite leaders in higher ed. Enrollify is made possible by Element 451, the next generation AI student engagement platform helping institutions create meaningful and personalized interactions with students. Learn more at element451.com.